All right, so last week we finished up talking about hydroboration oxidation of alkynes. We said with alkenes that you can do anti-Markovnikov addition of alcohols using borane, um, specifically borane coupled to THF. But with alkynes, that borane reagent is far too reactive. So we had to switch that to something really, really bulky. And so the borane reagents that we used were the diisamyl borane or the 9 bora bicyclo 331 nonane, which is usually referred to as 9-BBN. And we said the reason we use those is they're so bulky, they won't uh, react more than once. It kind of slows things down. All right. One thing we did talk about, though, was in this reaction, we go through this enol intermediate that quickly tautomerizes to an aldehyde. So I did want to go back and review that mechanism. All right, so let's talk about that mechanism. This one is base catalyzed. If you remember, we saw a tautomerization reaction previously with acid. This one, we don't have any acid around. We had sodium hydroxide and uh, hydrogen peroxide. So if you remember, we said we could take an alkyne like this. We could react it with something like 9-BBN in the first step, followed by sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. And whoops, which carbon is the alcohol going to get added onto, the red one or the green one? The red one, it's least substituted, so it would be anti-Markovnikov. <clears throat> so now we've got this enol here. And I'm actually going to draw out this OH bond completely like this. And like we said, we still have our hydroxide around from the hydrogen peroxide. So this reagent is around usually in excess. Where's the most acidic position on this enol? Is it one of the protons coming off the methyl group, one of the protons coming off the alkene, or the proton coming off the alcohol? The alcohol, absolutely. So now we can go ahead and we can say, we can deprotonate that position. And we could make a pretty good guess that that was the most acidic proton due to the cardio rules that we learned last term. So that proton was coming off the most electronegative atom. What else is stabilizing this conjugate base? Resonance. So this negative charge can delocalize to that carbon. Let me slide this all over. Now we have a double bond to our oxygen. We've got a hydrogen down here, hydrogen here, and a lone pair on our carbon. Our conjugate acid from this reaction is just water. So water is floating around. What do you think could happen next to get us to our aldehyde? We don't want an ani anionic product. We want a neutral one. And I'll give you a hint too, this side looks to me to be pretty close to an aldehyde already. We just need to get rid of that negative charge. So what will happen is this negative charge will steal the proton back from water. And we'll regenerate our hydroxide. And anytime you regenerate a reagent, you can assume it's catalytic, so you don't really need much hydroxide around to help favor this equilibrium. Does that make sense? 
All right, just like with the acid catalyzed cytomerization, the aldehyde form under equilibrium conditions is highly favored, so it'll be over 90% aldehyde almost all the time. Does that make sense? All right, so let's do a few practice ones. <clears throat> All right, the first one looks kind of similar to your pod. We're going to use 9 BBN in step one, followed by sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. And I'll make this one worth four points. And then I'll do a second one below where we try to predict our starting material. All right, let's check in on the first one. If we look at the first one, we've got two different sides of the alkyne. We've got this red side, and we've got this green side. Which side do you think is going to end up with the aldehyde? The green side, right? That's the less substituted side of the alkene. And then in addition to that, what I like to do is I like to number things. So for example, in this one, I would say, all right, coming off of the ring, we've got position one, position two, position three. We've got three carbons total. So we can quickly redraw this and say, all right, there's going to be a cyclohexane with three carbons. Say one, two, three. Carbon three is where the aldehyde is going to come off. So you can show your double bond to your oxygen. You can leave it like that if you want. However, oftentimes people will show this hydrogen as well. It's kind of pick whatever you're most comfortable with. So this would be the correct aldehyde for that first reaction. All right, now working backwards for the bottom one, we could say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons in that parent chain. And we know that there must have been a double bond, or sorry, a triple bond between carbon seven and eight, right? So working backwards with this, We can redraw this and we can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and be really careful that you don't lose a carbon in that process. The other thing too, I've seen a lot of lately, that kind of is a little irksome, is something that looks like that, where they say, well, there's still eight carbons there. What's wrong with that? The bond angles aren't right. So it's important to remember that alkynes are linear. So we want to make sure that we show this using approximate Vesper angles and that we account for every single one of our carbons. It's not the end of the world if you have a zigzag with your alkyne. It just looks weird. Um, so try to avoid that. I'll give you at least half points. I'm kidding. I'll give you full points. Uh, the analogy I heard once was it's like putting ketchup on sushi. It's not wrong, but just don't do it. Um, yeah, just keep your bond angles approximately what they should be. All right. So let's make a little summary sheet of these hydration reactions. Because this is a bit confusing. So we'll do a simple one first. Oops, I'm forgetting my substituent here. We saw that we could convert this alkyne 
to an aldehyde using 9-BBN, that bulky borane, or one of the other bulky boranes, followed by sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. Or, if we wanted to, we could convert this to a ketone. And what reagent did we need to convert this to a ketone? Does anybody remember? So we're going after the red carbon versus the green one. Yeah, we need an acid. Yeah, and we needed a mercury-2 salt. So for the bottom one, we needed catalytic acid. Usually it's sulfuric acid. And then we needed a mercury-2 salt. Normally that's mercury-2 sulfate. And in fact, let's be specific with our acid. I'll just write down H2SO4 as our acid. And then mercury-2 sulfate. And then this is usually done with water as well. We're not using straight concentrated acid for this reaction. But we can control Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov hydration by selecting the appropriate reagent. All right. In this example, this is a terminal alkyne. And why do we say it's terminal? Because we've got a proton off the end, right? So with terminal alkynes, we have selectivity. But let's take a look at another example. All right, in this example, we've got a green position and a red position. Which side do you think will be hydrated preferentially, or do you think it'll be a tie? Yeah, they're both equally substituted. The green carbon's bonded to another carbon. Same thing with the red carbon. So if you treat this with 9-BBN, followed by sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide, you'll get a mixture. You'll get one where the ketone is coming off of that red position, right? So I'll show that with red dots here and green dots here. Or you could have one where it comes off the other position. So if you have an internal alkyne, all of a sudden these reactions aren't super selective. And then people will say, well, what about the other reagent? In fact, the other reagent will give the exact same products. So internal alkynes can give mixtures. Especially if the starting alkyne that you're working with isn't symmetric at all. If it's symmetric, it doesn't really matter anymore. You're still going to get one product. Does that make sense? So that is one problem with these reactions is you don't get selectivity unless you're dealing with the terminal alkyne. Yeah? Um, should we put the water in the water For the bottom reaction? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, and I forgot my two for peroxide here. Uh, for the first one, it's all one pot, meaning it's not step one, step two. The hydroboration oxidation is two separate steps, so we have to number them. This reaction down here, everything's put into one round bottom flask. It's not broken up into multiple steps. Yep. All right, does that make sense? All right, we've got a couple more reactions. Yeah. Yeah, so the mercury-2 down here, that's our catalyst. Otherwise, without that catalyst, the activation energy is just simply too high for the hydration to occur. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> All right, so a couple more reactions. Luckily, these are kind of repeats of ones we've already seen. Next one is halogenation of alkynes.
All right, if you remember with alkenes, we can treat this with elemental bromine or elemental chlorine for that matter, and we get anti-addition of two bromine atoms. All right, with alkynes, we can do something similar. However, the mechanism isn't super well understood and is somewhat debated still. So we're going to kind of hand wave it away. If we treat this with elemental bromine, we can have one of the pi bonds in the alkyne do that addition reaction, right? Act as a nucleophile. So the expected product that we would get is observed, where you get anti-addition of bromines. However, it's not believed to go through a bromonium ion intermediate where you have that three-membered ring. And in fact, you get a mixture of two different intermediates. For your other intermediate, you get syn addition. Did I forget a carbon? Oh, thank you. Whew. There we go. So the expected project product where they're anti is your major intermediate. This one's minor. We're really not going to get into the reason behind that, but there's some debate as to whether or not there's radical character to this reaction. All right. What do you think happens if we continue reacting these with Br2? Yeah, we'll get more bromines added in. So then you can get your tetrahalogenated alkane. Conversely, if you want to just purposely overshoot, what most people will write is Br2 and excess, and that will just avoid those intermediates and just drive it all the way to completion. Once you get to that tetrahalogenated product, it's just going to stop there. You don't have any more nucleophiles to work with. The one tricky thing with this is due to the weird radical nature, you have to use a special solvent. And this solvent is carbon tetrachloride. The one downside to this is carbon tetrachloride is really, really bad for the environment, um, so much so that the U.S. government uh, regulates how much of this reagent or solvent a company can buy, and most companies are trying to phase it out of use because it's so problematic to buy and work with. But in our textbook, they still show it, so I wanted to show it to you as well. Make sense? All right couple more reactions. Ozonolysis. Everybody's favorite reaction. And like I said, a lot of these are very, very similar to the reaction with alkenes. So we'll do a little review with this alkene reaction. If we want to do ozonolysis, we need an ozone generator to make O3. And then we need a reducing agent for step two. What's a good reducing agent? DMS or zinc and water. There's a whole bunch of different reducing agents you can use. Like we said before, you can imagine this being like little molecular scissors where you can make two different aldehydes or ketones. In this example, they're identical. I like showing them this way, that way we can vis visualize where the double bond used to be. And you can use this to make ketones or aldehydes. It just depends on how substituted your starting alkene is. All right, with alkynes, we can do something similar. So for an alkyne, I'm going to show all of our different carbon atoms just so we can keep track of things. And the first carbon I'm going to label as green. Then the second carbon I'll label as red. And then I'll 
shove in my terminal proton. And for this one, you need ozone and water. In fact, this can be done all in one step. And for this specific example, I'm using a terminal alkyne. But just like before, we can imagine kind of cutting this triple bond down the middle there. All right, when this happens, you're still going to have that methyl group that's bonded to this green carbon. And then we're going to insert oxygens. So we'll have one double bonded oxygen coming off and then another one off here. And we've created a new carboxylic acid. The other carbon, the red one, what do you think happens to that red carbon if we're forcing as many oxygens on there as possible? What might it become? Carbon dioxide. So if we oxidize that carbon to its greatest extent, we can create carbon dioxide. Whoops. What do you think happens to that carbon dioxide during this reaction? It just bubbles out a solution. So that's how you know it's working. Yep. Not really. So you're asking about the reverse reaction of making ozone? No, you wouldn't do that using this sort of technique. There are other ways of making ozone, though. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at another example, though, where we don't use an internal alkyne. And I'm still going to color code things because I find that helpful. And this time we're going to have an isopropyl group coming off rather than a hydrogen. All right, let's try to predict what products we would get out this time. So I'll give you a minute to think about this and then check with your neighbor and see if you are getting the same answer. <clears throat> Give me a thumbs up if you think you got the product for this one. All right, it looks like most people have. We can imagine cutting this triple bond down the center, right? The green carbon will still have that methyl group coming off of it. And just like before, we're going to make a carboxylic acid. So that part's entirely the same. And then if we think about that red carbon, that will also be turned into a carboxylic acid but that carboxylic acid will have an isopropyl group coming off of it. So in this situation, we got two carboxylic acids. Does that make sense? So it's pretty similar. The main difference, though, is we're not making aldehydes and ketones. We're making a carboxylic acid and potentially carbon dioxide if we have a terminal alkyne. Make sense? All right, let's do a challenge one. I think we'll have enough time to do all this. What's that? We've got 20 minutes. I think we got enough time. Everybody likes to be challenged, right? All right, so starting from an alcohol. With five carbons or fewer,
make or synthesize the following. So this is our target. And we can only use the chemistry that we've learned. So there is a way to do this uh, transformation in one step using your action that we'll see later on this term, but we haven't learned it yet. So we got to use our alkene and alkyne chemistry. Does anybody think they got it? A few people did? Wow. I got to make my challenge problems harder now. No. <laughs> All right, let's just work slowly through this one, and I'll show you how I like to approach these. So, for example, I would look at this and I'd say, All right, what ways do I know of, of making a carboxylic acid? Ozonolysis. We only know one way, so that's easy. So for this, we need O3 and water. We don't need a special reducing agent for that. All right, so if we look at this product, we've got one, two, three, four carbons. We can start with an alcohol of five carbons. That's what I gave you as the direction. If we did ozonolysis, we must have lost a carbon in some way, shape, or form, right? So then we've got to predict, okay, well, what must our starting material have been? Well, it's probably an alkyne with one extra carbon, right, that was lost. So let's go ahead and draw that out. Right, because if we look at this, got one, two, three, four. We're gonna cut this in half. What happens to this fifth carbon? It becomes CO2, right? So we'd have CO2 gas as our byproduct. This would be carbon five in that reaction. Make sense? Okay, so now the question is, well, how can we make an alkyne? Yeah, we need to have a dihalide. So something that looks like this. And like we saw in our problem of the day, you can do this using sodium amide in excess followed by water to ensure that the proton coming off of carbon five there ends up on that final molecule, right? All right, and then the question is, well, how can we make a dihalide? From an alkene. So if you notice, there's a lot of these elementary reactions that become synthetically very useful. All right, and now we've got to figure out, well, how can we make an alkene from some sort of alcohol. So now we've got to kind of decide on this last step. So this must be an alcohol with five carbons. Does anybody have an idea of what the starting alcohol should be? Yeah, five carbons with an alcohol on the end, I think is a perfectly valid approach. <laughs> It's easy to overthink these. Now what? What reagent do we need? What's that? Yeah, tosyl chloride and pyridine. Why are we going to tosylate it? Exactly. This is something people forget a lot, that this is a bad leaving group. So we have to convert that to a good leaving group in our first step by tosylating it. And then for the second step, what should we add in? Some sort of base. What happens if we add sodium hydroxide in, though? We could do SN2 reactions and go completely backwards to our alcohol. So I would probably use a base that isn't a good nucleophile. What would a good non-nucleophilic base be? Sodium hydride? Sure. Sodium hydroxide, DBU, DBN, even terputoxide, you could say, would work pretty well there. But sodium hydride's nice and easy to use. All right, so we'll be doing a lot of these 
throughout this term. Um, we're going to try to build up to more and more difficult ones as we uh, cover more and more reactions. All right, one last reaction that we got to cover. <clears throat> Alkylation of alkynes. So for ozonolysis, we were basically chopping carbons off of an alkyne. Alkylation, we're going to be adding carbons to an alkyne. In fact, let me rephrase this, to a terminal alkyne. It doesn't work with internal alkynes, and we'll see why in a second. All right, so let's say we've got a terminal alkyne, meaning we've got a proton coming off the end. Does anybody remember what the pKa is of a terminal alkyne? You know, just off the top of your head? 25. 25. Holy cow, somebody knew that. <laughs> so the pKa is about 25, 24-ish in that ballpark. They, these protons are way more acidic than a normal alkane proton, right? A normal alkane proton has got a pKa of about 50, meaning 25 orders of magnitude less acidic. All right, so if we have a strong enough base, we can actually rip off that proton, right? And we want this base to be super strong, so I'm just going to indicate that. And when we make our final product here, we will have a negative charge off this terminal carbon. This is our acetylide ion. Oh my goodness, I'm not spelling this right. A C E And then we've also created our conjugate base. If you remember, this pKa or, or sorry, I said conjugate base. This is our conjugate acid. The pKa of our conjugate acid should be much higher than 25. Otherwise, we'd be dealing with an equilibrium reaction. All right, the cool thing with this is this acetylide ion is a very versatile intermediate. This is a great nucleophile. However, it's also a good base. So you can see we're getting back into our SN1, SN2 chemistry where we've got to decide, all right, is this going to do substitution or elimination? <laughs> all right, so once we have that acetylide ion in hand, we can use that as a reagent, and we can have it react with some sort of group. And I'm just going to make up an alkyl halide, so this is ethyl bromide. And this can attack that backside and kick off our leaving group and do an SN2 reaction. And now we've added in two extra carbons. All right. <clears throat> One thing to note, though, is that this group right here our electrophile needs to be a primary carbon or a methyl carbon. What do you think happens if we use, let's say, a tertiary alkyl halide? It would do an E2 reaction rather than SN2. We don't want it to do an E2 reaction. We want to do an alkylation and add carbons in. So I'll make a note here that secondary and tertiary favor E2, not SN2 chemistry. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go back up in our notes and try to look at the base that we need. 
So does anybody have a good base that they think would work for this initial deprotonation? What's that? So sodium hydroxide would be a reasonable guess. If we use sodium hydroxide, the pKa of our conjugate acid would be about 15, meaning it's actually got a lower pKa than the thing we're trying to deprotonate. So probably not powerful enough. However, we've been using another base pretty frequently with alkynes. What was that base? Sodium amide. So sodium amide's really nice as a base. We use it really heavily with all of our alkynes. It's nice and rugged. And then the conjugate acid is ammonia, which is really easy um, to remove from solution, right? Ammonia is a volatile gas. All right, so let's take a look at an example. All right, in this example, we're going to start out with the simplest alkyne. You can either call this ethyne or acetylene. Acetylene is the more commonly used name. And acetylene is used in oxyacetylene tanks. However, it's also a major organic building block. And if we wanted to, we could deprotonate one of these protons hanging off the end using sodium amide. In fact, let's break this down into steps. Make our acetylide ion. Then we could add in something like an alkyl halide. This could do an SN2 reaction. just like we previously saw. However, we could do this one more time. Make another acetylide ion because this had two terminal protons coming off of it. Have this react with more ethyl bromide. Do it a second SN2 reaction. to give us our dialkylated product. If you want to show this using one simple reaction arrow, so I'll make this our target, you can actually break this down into four separate steps and just number them, right? Rather than showing all of your intermediates. So you can write NaNH2 followed by ethyl bromide followed by more NaNH2, <laughs> followed by more ethyl bromide. So for some of these synthetic problems, you can stack these one on top of another. Um, just remember that you need to number them to indicate that they're being done in completely separate steps. Does that make sense? All right. Believe it or not, that's the last reaction we're going to learn for alkynes. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is more of an activity. So what I'll have for you are kind of mini poster boards, and then we'll create a big mind map of all these reactions, almost like a subway system of organic chemistry transformations. So we'll be working on that tomorrow just as a way of reviewing all of these.